Lauren Simkin Burke is a Brooklyn based artist and illustrator who identifies primarily as a drawer of the ink on paper variety. Most of Burke's personal work starts with drawing based on photographs and ephemera, which get transformed into paintings, etchings, mixed media, assemblage, and collage work. Burke's illustration work is figurative, narrative, and increasingly conceptual, intended to evoke the experiment. Ex experiential, sorry, memory of the reader, whether from the experience of reality, dreams, or the imagination. Burke creates illustrations for clients such as the New York Times, Boston Globe, the Paris Review, Simon & Schuster, and Remy Martin, and has been publishing art books and zines under the name Captain Sears Press since 2012. Uh, so Lauren will be available for a, a Q&A afterwards, uh, so please keep your questions to the end. Um, now I'm very happy to invite Lauren to the podium. This lecture is called Improvisational Visual Narrative. Is that mm -hmm. a surrealist approach to story, which is really just a fancy way of saying that I uh, create images first um, in an improvisational practice and then um, allow stories to come um, from the images and from juxtaposition of images instead of writing an outline first or a story first and making images to fit that story. Um, I want to go over a few definitions uh, just so that you know at least my understanding of the words that I'm using. Um, the first definition is the subconscious um, existing or operating in the mind beneath or beyond conscious awareness. Um, Freud was the sort of person who popularized the use of the sub subconscious and then he actually stopped using it. He started using unconscious instead because he thought that subconscious was um, not precise enough. Um, in, in my usage of it, I'm really talking about allowing, um, allowing the part of your brain that you can't really control to make decisions. Um, or trusting that the decisions that that part of your brain is making are going to be interesting and possibly more interesting than what you would be able to come to in your um, conscious awareness. The next word is surrealism, um, which is an artistic and literary practice that came out of World War II, um, World War I actually, sorry, um, in the 20s. Um, it came out of Dada and it was sort of a, a revolutionary artistic movement um, that was specifically looking at um, trying to break all norms um, and it was focused on the subconscious and automatic drawing and um, collaboration and, um, and fun. They sort of thought of their artistic works not as art but as artifact of the movement that they were a part of. And then the third word is ethnography which is the, the field practice of anthropology. Um, I studied a, a cultural anthropology in college, and while I never intended to be an anthropologist and I am not an anthropologist, um, I think of my work in a lot of ways like a very loose visual ethnography. Um, so when you are an anthropologist going into a culture that you don't know or that you are trying to learn about, you try to take in as much information as you can without um, affecting the environment um, and you try to understand the the logic about why people are doing what they're doing within their particular um, society. So to give you a little bit of context, um, I grew up in New York. I grew up on the very eastern side of the Upper East Side, which is called Yorkville. Um, I went to sort of oddball schools that allowed for um, a lot of autonomy as a student very young. Um, and so I grew up with a interest in learning, an intense interest in learning and reading, um, not so much a skill set of like test taking and um, rote memorization. Um, and while that may have been a burden in terms of certain parts of school, I think that it served me well in adulthood and in art making. When I was 10 years old, 
I was given a book by my father called The Alien Diaries that is to this day my favorite book and probably the most influential thing that has come into my life. Um, it is a book about an alien that comes to New York to, to learn about human culture. Uh, the publisher's note reads, we are proud to be the publisher of the first book written by an alien on Earth. The alien landed in New York City on September 3rd, 1985. She left on March 3rd, 1986. The Alien Diaries shows her keen observations of our planet and society. New York City was her laboratory for her. New York's people, architecture, art, sports, and games become a microcosm of all our society. The book includes photographs, works from her intimate daily journal, and analysis. She says this about analysis. An analysis is the total number of intersecting lines and curves whose sum is equal to the observations, images, comp computations, meditations, as well as predictions and rumors, all of which completely reveal a studied objective, um, object or environment according to her perspective. An incisive book of this sort of analysis contains within it all answers to life's questions. So the alien comes to New York, addresses the nation, goes on the Barbara Walters show on ABC, uh, goes to the Brooklyn Bridge, looks at bread in Vesuvio Bakery, rents a canoe in Central Park, and my favorite spread as a child was walking through the park with Yoko Ono, learning about haiku. <laughs> Today, I was with Yoko and Ono in Central Park. She was very generous to me. We talked about strawberries. She showed me some Japanese characters, man, big, moon. When I returned to my hotel room, I wrote this poem in earth style. The sky is blue, the grass is green, my happiness is unlimited. During my walk in Central Park, I noticed a word carved in marble. Everyone who passed, it, it stood for a minute in deep silence, reflect, in di deep silent reflection. Perhaps this word has a mystical, magical meaning for Earth's inhabitants. Here it is, imagine. The next section is Soho, their galleries. their buildings, their games and sports, which is oddly a section I've completely repressed and didn't remember it existing. <laughs> <laughs> their weather. The weather in New York changes consistently. I observed their seasons and I felt uncomfortable with their established system. Here is my suggestion. <laughs> Spring, summer, fall, winter, other seasons. I am positive that this new arrangement will be far more convenient for the Earth's needs. And then my favorite thing was this appendix, ping pong appendix, these elaborate ping pong diagrams for which I have still not fully ever understood, um, but love and take as great inspiration. So I work as an illustrator, which basically means people send me texts and for articles, for books, and I read that text and I pull imagery out of it, um, what makes sense to me. Um, and uh, these are some samples of the kind of work that I do. So this is a, an illustration for Family Circle about parents who have students who are about to go off to college and how to handle that transition. Um, this is a recent piece for the New York Times about Trump's latest attempt at a trans military ban. Um, this was a holiday uh, card for Jews United for Justice. And this is a page out of a series of interior illustrations for a book called The Art of Business Value, which is about IT CEO stuff that I had to read and I understood the time, but I do not for the life of me, remember at all. <laughs> um, so I create a variety of other kinds of work, basically for myself. Um, I do drawings, I make paintings, 
I do etchings, collage, comics, and puppets. And those end up in gallery shows or books or zines or sometimes just in drawers. Um, I've split up the things I'm going to show you into fiction, nonfiction, and then a separate section called comics, doodles, and puppets and animation, something like that. Because even though those might fit into the fiction section, they seem like of a different quality. Um, when I was in third grade, I wrote a book called The King that was very, very small. Um, this was not necessarily a self-generated project. This was a school project. And I have no memory of the um, specifics of how it came about or how I created it. So I can't verify that I created the images first. But I can say this, was, this is the first narrative that I have a record of ever creating. Um, a long time ago, there was a king that was very, very small. He was so small that he could not climb on his throne. He could not eat a grape. <laughs> Three inches tall. <laughs> um, I've left the text out of these other ones just because I, uh, they're, they're so incredibly embarrassing, so much more embarrassing than these images that I'm just going to try and narrate from memory. Um, he goes to a scientist and asks if he could get a potion that would make him larger. Um, and the, po and the, the scientist says, yes, I happen to have one right here. It lasts for two months or three months or something. And he's like, OK, great, I'll try it. So he grows bigger and then goes to a party. <laughs> um, then for some reason, he stays over at the place where the party was and then takes his carriage home the next day. And then he goes home. And the first thing he does is reads a big book apparently that was the best thing you could possibly do. And um, once the potion wears off, he goes back to the scientist's house. And this is where I think it gets really weird. I don't understand why these things happen. But apparently, the child, the daughter of the scientist, has decided to create an arranged marriage for the king. She set up a whole like dinner set up in, in her dollhouse. And, um, and the king goes along with it. And there's like a wedding. And then he's married, and it's you know happily ever, ever after. Um, OK, so that's third grade. That's a while ago, right? It's like 30 years ago. When I was in college, um, I studied anthropology. And I went right into grad school afterwards. I went to the um, Illustration as Visual Essay program here at SVA. And I was, I think, working on relatively serious, serious work during that program. But I also did a bunch of unserious things to try and counterbalance my time to, or my sanity. Um, I had a bunch of these uh, plastic toys. Um, there was a wind-up chick that I also had, but I don't know where it is. These are all models that are the exact same ones I was drawing from. Um, and I decided to use them like I would models in a life drawing session. Um, I would put them in positions and draw them, and I really had no plan. Um, and they became a book called The End. Why won't you look at me while I'm talking to you? Why did you bring them? I thought we were meeting alone. She won't answer her phone. Can you at least tell her that I'm sorry? She asked me to tell you she's sorry. Just because she says she's sorry doesn't mean she is. <laughs> I can't let her take over my life again. Can I talk to you for a minute? No, I need to be alone. So I know that I made voice bubbles in the drawings, but I really had no idea what the dialogue was going to be until after I created the images. And I don't have any record to show why or how that happened but it's just sort of how my brain works and what makes sense to me. Um, within a few years after graduating from grad school, I started collecting old photographs. I also had no plan when I was doing that. I didn't know that I was going to draw from them. I didn't know they were going to take over my life. Um, I got maybe seven or 10 from a flea market. And I started drawing them every day. Um, I started collecting Victorian photos as well as 20th century photos. Um, and I ended up 
thinking of this as a very extended ethnographic study, looking at how people document their lives, how they create mythologies of self and family and place. Um, so for 10 plus years, almost every weekday, I would do a drawing based on one of these photos. I would carry about 50 of them in an envelope in my bag. I would go to a coffee shop. I would rifle through them, pick one out, just whichever one called to me that day, um, and draw it. It might take 25 minutes. It might take 45 minutes. And then that work became what I ended up using for all of my other work. So I have like 100 of these sketchbooks filled with hundreds of drawings. I think it's actually about 1,600. Um, and you know, not all of those pieces have made, them, made their way into other things, but um, many of them have. In 2008, I started working on this series of collages uh, where I was photocopying my sketchbooks and including the drawings with my to-do lists or whatever happened to be on the rest of the page. Um, and it became this very large series of about 70 pieces um, that I exhibited at AIR Gallery um, in a show called Excavations and Adaptations. Soon after I had the show, um, Illustrations Visual Essay was putting together a show about the history of the graphic novel. And I was asked repeatedly if I would include something in the show, and I didn't have anything that I thought made sense. So I decided to create a book um, where I took portraits from excavations and adaptations, and then I took text from Craigslist, Missed Connections, um, and it became this, a Facebook of Missed Connections. You were the adorable guy with a jean jacket, red post bag, cute conductor's hat, infectious smile, and beautiful eyes reading a book around 11.45 on the L. I think you got on at Graham. I got off at Morgan. This is a long shot, but I can't stop thinking of your adorable face. Are you out there? You had a dog at first. Then I saw you again on Graham with no dog. Then I saw you on Humboldt. You want to say hello? You got off the L train at Bedford around midnight Tuesday night, and I complimented your shark backpack and then left abruptly. But then later I was like, damn, I wish I'd said something else. You got off the L train at Graham Ave with your blonde female friend at around 5 AM, but not before saying to me, good night, sexy. You, tall, skinny, extremely cute, wearing jeans, a striped shirt, and a blazer, me, brown hair, beard, black pants, navy, something that I can't remember, can't read, green tote. Um, soon after all of that, I, uh, I started excavating all the figures out of the drawings that I've been doing from found photos. So it becomes sort of like a domino effect of like something, you know, something that started as sort of a random whim became an incredibly obsessive daily process, and that sort of ended up affecting all parts of my life and work. Um, so I was excavating these figures and creating new environments for them. Um, some of those environments were based on the sketchbook drawings I was doing, um, and some of them were completely imagined. Um, this is sort of an in-progress progress photo of my studio while I was about a third of the way through making them. Um, I call them the Littles. And I realized that I was going to be putting them in these dioramas, and I wanted to have a record of the individual figures. So I started photographing them in a cigar box that I thought of as a, a, like a studio, like a traditional portrait studio. Um, so here's an example of the portrait of one of the figures, then the diorama that it's in. This piece is called Into the Woods. Um, this is called Choices. This is called, um, the piece on the right is, is called it's, it's No Picasso, which is a joke of like the kind of thing my mother would say if she was asked if she liked a piece when she was walking through a museum. 
So I ended up liking these portraits. Um, and I decided that I wanted to do something with them. And what I decided to do was a collaborative book project with a friend of mine who's a writer. I sent him 100 of these portraits. And he wrote letters to them. Um, the letters were all fiction, but they were extremely detailed in terms of um, specificity of time and language and how things were dated and addresses. And um, the book ended up um, being called Dear Letters Office. Dear Alan, one thing is for sure, my new school stinks. Pittsburgh isn't so bad, though. Saturdays, I bag groceries at the A&P on Butler Street, which is near our apartment. Sundays, I take the trolley, which they want to switch for a bus, around town exploring. So two days every week are filled with strangers, spellbinding. The other five are filled with kids. Kids here look at me like I'm a maniac. No one knows what to do with me. Too fat and brainy, I guess. I'm um, campaigning to homeschool myself, but my mother just rolls her eyes. It's important to socialize with other children, she says. I roll my eyes back. I miss being your best friend. Do you think you might ever visit Pittsburgh? Sincerely, Phil. Dear Atkinson, the samples are back from the dye shop. Two are included in the box for your perusal. This is a sample number seven, six, the specific issues, number seven, and the specific issues to be addressed were narrowing the flange near the end by six, no, three sixteenths of an inch, enlarging the cupped underside at the widest point by a quarter, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these issues should be fixed, and I mention them so that you too can review the piece with full information. Thus far, every alteration comes under the original contract and not incurring us additional expense with Dabrowski Brothers, who have pledged in their conversations with me, not to mention the contract, to provide us with a perfect issueless mold. I have faith, however, this process does, does go on. Let us pray for a saleable product when the spring, when the spring runs. Please send feedback at your earliest convenience. Regards, Brooks. Darling Eddie, it doesn't seem right with me to set my thoughts out on paper. It never did. Some go, same goes vis-a-vis -vis my heart. As well you know, just before 10 o'clock, the train rolled into Boston and I marched down the stairs into the T, surrounded by bankers, Harvard boys, freshly discharged soldiers, and struggling alcoholics. Never have I felt more forlorn. I might, never, uh, I might as well have stepped off the train in the outpost north of Winnipeg, given how frostbit and vacant Boston feels, even in August. It shrinks a little every time I come home from you. George fixed me a stiff rye and ginger. He thinks camping back and forth across the carpet will cheer me up. He reads those awful 25-cent novels you find in the bus station. He thinks they're funny a point he attempts to prove by reading them out theatrically. But even the golden bowl would make me cry tonight. All I can think of is your crinkled green gray eyes and your strong hands resting on my shoulder. So I left George in the living room to chew up the wallpaper while I finished my cocktail in front of the typewriter. A snapshot of you at Reese Park last weekend is set up on my bookshelf. George says you are too, too. Let the printed word rest at that. You may fill in the rest. The words you know I whisper every night in my prayers. I remain your devoted Jimmy. Um, there are a couple that I don't have images of because I wasn't able to put everything together in time um, that I wanted to read. Um, just to give you a sort of larger breadth of the, the kinds of letters. Some of them are much shorter, like this. Dearest Sally, I'm on leave in beautiful Paris, wishing this was not war and you were by my side. Pray for a speedy end and our safe return. All my love, Bunchy. Listen, Larry, my mind is made up. No trinket or figure or, heaven forbid, experimental sculpture doll will convince me that I should continue to live like a tramp on a pullout in your studio. Tell your wife you love her, goddammit. You helped yourself to my body, 
to make art with your, for your gallery and so, that your gallery sold, but your sermons about aesthetics are making me sick. Put your weapons down, I'm leaving. Sure, Larry, ancient peoples sculpted figurines of bodies they feared the most, and the figurines walked and talked of their own accord. Ipso facto, you are the priest of a goddamn ancient cult. Okay, Larry, screw you and goodbye. P.S. I wrapped the leftover roast in tinfoil and stuffed it in my valise. Carve the rest yourself, open the freezer door, stare the pig in the face. Um, so this is the first book that I really did in collaboration with somebody else. Um, it was not just working with the writer, but working with friends and acquaintances to actually write, hand write the letters to make them look like authentic ephemera. Um, and it was a very interesting project. I've sort of gone back to doing things where I'm doing everything myself because it, I know that I can control that and sometimes that is what seems the most comfortable. Um, but the result of the book um, was really wonderful and I'm, I really love it and I'm glad that I did it. Um, on to nonfiction. I'm going to start with a piece that is from a similar era from the king that was very, very small. It's a presentation uh, about George Washington. Um, everyone in my class was assigned a president and we had to write a short biography where we could tell everyone in the class who we were and when we had been a president. And I don't understand how the things in this presentation qualified as important enough to be the things that were illustrated, but um, he made himself known to the people. <laughs> <laughs> I was a very nice man and a very good leader. Sounds like a little too much like current, current president, unfortunately. <laughs> he kissed the Bible and swore he was the first prez of USA. <laughs> um, when I was in grad school, um, there was a, a book project. It's a pre-thesis project that everyone d does in their second semester of the first year it gets exhibited the, the first semester of their second year. Um, and what I decided to do was to go visit my friends in the town where I went to college and to document that weekend. So I took my camera and I took like six rolls of film, um, but I also drew in my sketchbook and it became this book called Two Point Days of Ketchup in Ithaca. Um, Friday, 3.30 p.m. New York, central New York is quite beautiful in the fall and winter. I tend to notice this when I take the bus between Ithaca and the city. This trip up, I try to draw the way the trees huddle together. Pretty much all the text is un, I don't think I copy edited. There are lots of errors. Um, I just did it once. I was, it was a very, it was 2001, 2002. So computers were very slow at the time. Friday. 4.05 to 6 p.m., Laura Wong's room. I spent almost two hours with Laura Friday afternoon. Most of that time was consumed with calming her down and setting up a reasonable schedule for her to write the three papers she had to write within the next six days. She's on the phone with her new boy, Alejandro, informing him of the new plan. They will go to Hughes' going away party for a little bit, but will refrain from going out dancing at the common ground with everyone. Saturday. Anyway, last time I was in Ithaca, I didn't get to see Elise. So this was the first time I'd seen her since last, I last visited, she last visited the city, I believe last June or July. She's working an annoying food service job, waitressing at a semi-nice restaurant. She's not very happy, but I'm sure, I'm not sure she's ever really happy. She's applying to grad school for art history and I think for a few places for textile design. I hope she ends up in the city. Uh, behind Elise is the bagel making part of College Town Bagels, where we were meeting. Um, sits a girl who's wearing a, um, who's been working at CTB for about a year and a half. She is on her break. She's wearing a fuzzy reindeer horned headband. Um, all of CTB's employees are wearing similar headbands, and I feel so sorry for them. 
Um, then we went to the supermarket and had sushi, as you do. Very exciting. And for some reason, we're diagramming uh, different tea paraphernalia. Um, I only came with four rolls of film, which I don't fully understand. So in the middle of the book, we had to go to the camera store so that I could get more film. The camera store was closed, so then we had to go back to the supermarket and get film at the supermarket. Um, the friend that I was staying with is diabetic, so then when we were at the supermarket, she had a sugar scenario where she, we had to like feed her immediately and wait for her sugar to get back to normal. Um, and then because coffee and coffee shops were so important, there was a meditative page on um, sip-top coffee lids. Uh, the dorm I lived in was built to um, look like a castle. And so there are lots of really strange spaces, one of which is this very tiny triangular bathroom, which I decided warranted an entire spread of the book. Um, coffee shop before going to a show. Another coffee shop uh, with my friend Jen and her ex-girlfriend Meredith. Um, so it was mainly about the awkwardness of them seeing each other after not having seen each other for a very long time. Um, skipping forward a bit, uh, most of my personal work since then um, has been based on these photos I collected. So it's all about other people, other people's family photos, um, which I love because I feel like they show a universe that a universality of human experience that you can look at almost anyone's family photo and feel a connection to it and feel like you can relate regardless of whether it was in the 1920s, the 1970s, or it was yesterday. Um, and I'd been developing a lot of processes I was using, um, etching and painting, etc. cetera, um, and I decided that it was time to apply those processes to my own personal ephemera. Um, my mother had passed away about seven years ago, and I had been sort of waiting until I was ready to start making work about that. And so I, I ended up working on paintings for a show called Neither the Other or Myself, and that turned into a book as well. So um, this is a painting called Two City. Um, I should say that the paintings were half um, you know, figurative and half her to-do lists. And these are sort of as they were laid out in the book. Um, while I was working on the statement for the exhibit, I ended up writing a piece called 20 Lessons, um, which were 20 things that my mother taught me that I wanted to start, that I thought would be good to share with people. Um, there were three versions of that. One was typed one was handwritten, and one was all the pages typed, layered on top of each other, so you couldn't actually read anything. But it sort of was my favorite version. Um, I'm going to show you the handwritten version, not all of 20. Um, jobs you hate are helpful in figuring out what you don't want to do in the future. Uh, love is, in and of itself, not enough to sustain a successful relationship. One should not expect upon retirement that the Jim Henson Company will make a puppet in your likeness, though it has been known to happen. And I have to, so, so my mother was a, was a lawyer, and she, um, she was outside counsel for Jim Henson Company for 30 years. So when she retired, they did make a puppet in her likeness for her so, and presented it to her um, at her retirement party. And it was definitely, like, not fair. <laughs> 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 but... Still awesome. <laughs> um, we didn't have a lot of close connections to my family when I was growing up. I mean, we, we, I mean, I saw my family, but my mother's close connections were always with her friends. So even though um, it wasn't a chosen family in the sense of like being a part of a queer community and having a chosen family for that, um, I always was taught that ha creating a chosen family of friends is just as valid as having a traditional family. Um, based on my mother's work experience, which was being extremely good at her job, um, and the fact that I knew that she hated it 
even though she excelled at it. Um, I was taught very early on that it's, it's not a given that doing work that you were good or excellent at will be fulfilling. Um, and because my mother was always told that real estate is a great investment, but she, she lost money every time she ever bought an apartment. Um, regardless of what they say, real estate is not always a great investment. Um, my mother loved blueberry muffins, uh, an intense love, but she was also very critical. I mean, she was very critical of everything, but to find the perfect blueberry muffin was like almost an impossible feat. And so for maybe the last five years of her life, I dedicated Mother's Day to bringing her a test taste of like th five different blueberry muffins to try to find the perfect blueberry muffin. Um, this next lesson is the most uh, difficult to do in some ways and the, the most serious, and it's uh, based on what we didn't do and should have done, which is when dealing with serious medical issues, it is imperative to have assessments made by at least two doctors from different institutions before deciding what course of action to take. Even if you are using a doctor who's the top of the line, best in their field, they're gonna slip up at some point and it's important to cover your bases because it's your life and it's your family's life. It's important to have at least one person who can read your handwriting. <laughs> Finishing all the books by your favorite author can be devastating. <laughs> there are few things more satisfying than having the right box when the need arises. There can always be more scallions in a scallion pancake. A good cobbler should be cherished. And evidence is the most important part of building a strong case. The last section that was drawn in the book um, were drawings of my mother's things, things that for the most part are a part of my daily life, um, whether it's for decoration or for actual utilitarian use. So, these are markers and pens that I have of hers that are dried out and don't really work, but I still keep them. Um, this is a, uh, on the right, a sewing kit of hers that I couldn't find for years, and finally I found in a box in her, her husband's storage room, and finally I was able to take it home. Um, when she passed away, I actually went into all of her bags and the pockets of her jackets and everything and like took all of the pieces of paper I could find with her handwriting, and I had them in a drawer waiting and then finally I sort of knew what to do with them and I ended up drawing them. Um, we had different size shoe feet, but we, our feet are the same shape. So even though our shoes were different sizes, I could fit into her shoes. I don't necessarily wear them, but I kept some of her favorites so that maybe someday if I wanted to, I could. And she also had a shoe stretcher, which apparently is not a normal thing for someone to have, but I find it to be very useful. Um, and it, it, it is sort of out for stretching my shoes when it is necessary. Um, this is a, like a pair of Adidas, probably from the early 80s, um, and a, some sort of to-do list. Um, and then the last section in the book um, are these portraits, photographs that I took of her um, when I was in high school in 1997. Okay, so the next section, comics, doodles, puppets, and futzing around with animation. Um, my earliest comics I don't have any record of. I believe I called them the popcorn comics. I don't know, I mean, I, I think that the characters were, were, were popcorn, but besides, <laughs> but besides that, I don't really remember the content. I'm sure they were brilliant. Um, but when I was in college, a part of this process of procrastinating, I decided I needed to have a focused, uh, focused procrastination process or project. So I decided to do a, a comic strip that I would make once a week and I would hand out to everyone in class. Um, I, I called it Feinberg, um, partly as an homage to Leslie Feinberg, but partially um, because I wanted it to be like a, a place where these characters were fine, even though the characters are these like very smart high school students who are extremely bored and frustrated and just like, or like waiting for like their lives to start um, and being pretty snarky along the way. So the characters are Lenny, Darce, Janice, Yoko, Joy, and Jess. Um, 
Hey Lenny, what you got there? The essence of life. Looks like coffee to me. You wouldn't understand. Understand what? That you've become prematurely addicted to caffeine? Well, yes. So very, like all of these were drawn first. I might have made notes in the margin about like what the text could be, but the text could have been almost anything. Um, in this one, they're, they're replicating works of important art, the thinker, the discus thrower, uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, and then um, that was the best study hall ever, except for that time we got Dr. Mr. James to believe Janice had Tourette's. Yeah, that was great. When did Thanksgiving turn into Turkey Day? When it became more about surviving the food coma and less about being thankful. I'm scared. What do our families do with us when we're in our comas? Hopefully by then they're so drunk that they forget we exist and leave us emotionally unscathed. We have social studies, we have a social studies test next period. I thought you were going to study. I was listening to NPR's replay of the Republican presidential debates. I thought it was relevant to what we're learning about ink and ritual slaughter. When I grow up, I want to be a cross between MacGyver and Annie Hall. That's interesting. What do you, um, why do you think that is? Because my parents took away my TV in 1988. Our time is up. Um, I did Feinberg for a number of years past graduating grad school and I tried to get it syndicated and I couldn't get it syndicated even though everyone that I showed it to really loved it. They just said that they couldn't publish it. Um, which I found um, frustrating and sad and because part of the reason I was doing it was to try and give a, a voice to sort of androgynous female characters um, and I wasn't getting it anywhere. I just sort of gave it up altogether. I also was not 100% sure the best way of including the text so I just sort of let it go. Um, and I've done some comics here and there but for the most part the 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 most serious comic that I did since then was right after Trump was elected. Um, and it was for um, a publication called Resist that was made a, a tabloid sized um, newspaper of political comics to hand out um, on the January 21st protests that were happening the day after the inauguration. So I did this three page comic called Just Another Saturday. Um, the It's wordless other than the sort of words from signage, um, and it's about a group of friends that go on a quest to an imagined um, Mount Rushmore where Trump has had his face added, and they go to deface it and write not our president, and then they trek around to try and find his billboards that are still up to try and repaint over them. Um, after doing that and having it published in Resist, I ended up expanding it. Um, with these pages um, and I used that as the promotional mailer I sent out that New Year's um, which was sort of the first time I'd gone off format and really shown anything quasi or really political in my promotional material to as an illustrator um, but I, I didn't think that sending a regular promo at the time was appropriate. Um, going to wind back a bit. Um, in 2008, I started drawing this character. Um, I was trying to teach myself French, so I made vocabulary cards. But the way in which I was finding the words was by going through a dictionary that was from the 1950s. So the definitions were very odd. A lot of them, um, yeah, they were, I mean, I like them, but they're not necessarily useful for uh, everyday usage. Um, I ended up calling the character the French guy um, because in French the name Guy is spelled the way Guy is spelled in English. Um, and he's become the way in which I draw when I'm drawing, doing sort of automatic drawing, when I'm doodling, when I'm on the train. Um, I have hundreds of these drawings of the French guy um, that have turned into a bunch of things, um, but also are sort of waiting to find the right thing to like be, be in public, to be published in some way. 
Um, I, two years ago, started playing around with frame animation in Photoshop. So I, at the end, I'm going to show you some very, very short animations um, that were made based on the train doodles. Um, this one is for a thing called Pick a Book. And this one is called For the Love of Milkshakes. Um, and then around the same time, or right after I started doing those animations, I started building these puppets, because I realized that I could do stop animation in the same process. Um, and I didn't have any plan. I didn't draw these characters out. I was only looking at reference from like Audubon Society like books about mammals. Um, and within about two months of starting to build them, I ended up um, getting asked to do a series uh, of 20 images for an, an online literary magazine called Five Dials. So what that ended up being was a visual essay um, about the puppets going to see an exhibit of Victorian portraits. I was sort of basing this on my memory of Ferris Bueller's Day Off and that montage where they go to the um, museum and you see all of these sort of very serious pictures of them trying to understand the art. Here are a few in context. Um, and then I started building props for them and sets. So I've done a lot of still photography with them. Um, and I've done some animation, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, but this, the still photography is what's been the most interesting to me, just because it stresses me out the least. The having props and trying to not knock them over, I find extremely stressful. I'm trying to work through that, but I've yet to, to really do it. So this is the first animation. These were all improvised. Um, I had made a bunch of tests with some drawings I'd done of dancer friends. And since those had been drawn without the intention of animating them and they sort of worked, I decided it would be OK if I just um, futzed around. Um, and clearly, they could be better. There could be better transitions. It would be nice if they were longer. Um, so these are the initial tests with the puppets. Um, I've been describing them as really, really bad dancing for the most part. Um, they have wires in the feet, and the, the ground has a grid of holes dug into them, so they're able to stand. Um, and I was doing these tests for the most part before I had sets and props. Um, and there's one that I'll show later that's uh, the one I did that scared me off of doing them anymore <laughs> because it. Uh, I moved so many things that the narrative ended up being that there was like a ghost in the studio because things <laughs> kept moving. Yeah. Someday I'll figure it out. Yeah, hokey pokey. It's important. Very important narratives. In some ways, these like short three second things, even though they're tiny, um, people seem to find them engaging. Um, which I think is kind of funny. So this was done with the, the piece for Five Dials for their online use. I was trying to do, I was trying to make these as though they were like taken on someone's phone, like what they were, they, they were trying to document their visit to, to the gallery and the sort of outtake moments.
This is the Studio Ghost one. It's like completely, <laughs> completely incapable of not knocking everything over. Yeah, so that's <laughs> literally it. Um, the first still from that I actually submitted to uh, American Illustration that got in a couple of years ago. Um, so a few months ago, I did a piece about voting, like why Americans don't vote um, for the New York Times. And I decided to, in an attempt to practice doing a longer animation, um, by longer I mean like 20 seconds instead of seven seconds, um, I, I made this. don't know what's happening except that everybody's leaving. And then the last is um, a more recent animation I did with the puppets um, going back to not having all those sets. Um, and it's a show and tell. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I, in some ways would have liked to have been able to uh, go over um, the details of the processes I use, but there are just too many of them. Um, and I, uh, I guess just want to end by saying that I, I think that visual stories starting from images like shouldn't be a revolutionary thing or a completely unusual thing, but even within visual communities it seems to be. So hopefully there are people out there that think that way and just aren't talking about it, and maybe um, this is a, a good opener for them to do so. Um, and I guess we're doing a Q&A. Yeah. 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 OK, um, my question is like, um, how long did you spend on, this, on making this animation? Did you do them all by yourself, or somebody's helping you, especially for the stop motion part? All by myself, and my patience level is a, about, a, I would say, 20 to 45 minutes of actually photographing. And I've never made a plan. It's always been improvised, because I just am too impatient to have a plan for that kind of thing. Um, and then about two hours or so of um, assembling. Those puppets were amazing. Um, what were they made out of, and like, kind of, what was your inspiration for making the puppets um, in the first place? They're made out of um, Sculpey um, with a metal armature. The metal that is in the main armature is sort of a soft metal. I, at some point, I should find one that's a little bit stronger so that it doesn't ever snap. Um, and then there's a, a much uh, thinner but stronger wire that's attached to the feet that comes out of the feet so that they can um, stand. Um, and they're painted in acrylic, and the, the clothing is all like scraps of my clothing turned into clothing. Um, and the inspiration was, I, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, when you are working with a client, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if um, where some of your animations were for clients or not. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, um, like in terms of dealing with your client, if they want to see like preparatory work or you, they want to know what you're doing before yeah, you execute? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the ones that were for a client, um, I mean, it was an unusual circumstance because it wasn't, they weren't providing me with the content. I was, give, I, I, I did pitch what I wanted to do, but I was creating my own content. I basically made mock-ups of what I thought it was going to look like, even though it was sort of rough, just to give them a style. And I mm. gave them an idea in terms of the feeling that I wanted. Um, but they were incapable of understanding what I was saying. So it was more, at a certain point, them trusting that they were going to like what I did. Um, and there was some back and forth in the end. But gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about how you found a publisher for your work when you were starting out. Um, well, for illustration work or for the other? For your, your picture 
Um, I actually, for the most part, self-published because I was, I, I have book projects that I've been working on for 10 years that I haven't been able to find a publisher for. So at a certain point for certain things where I wanted control, I decided to become my own publisher. So. What was your marketing plan for that? How'd you go about promoting marketing? Poor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the first book I published was an, a, an extended exhibition catalog for a show I had in 2012 called To Be Kept. And I paid for that by doing a Kickstarter. It was sort of the early days of Kickstarter. And that created a, a group of 100 people who were already sort of buying into the, the book um, that allowed to me to, to publish it without having to put in that much of my own money. Um, books that I've done since then, I, um, I haven't done that for. Um, and that's been a challenge. But the way Kickstarter works now is very different than before. And I've done a couple of projects since then and found it extremely frustrating. So I try to limit doing that as much as I can. Um, but the really good thing about crowdfunding in that way is that you're creating an audience that's invested in the product um, from the get-go. Um, I do sort of have you know, people who are interested in buying the stuff I do, so I do pre-orders. So there are some people who already knew, know and buy the product before I publish them. Um, but the, otherwise, I sort of assume that I'm going to be a, like a storage facility for all these books, for the most part, um, for a very long time, because it, they're going to go pretty slowly, because I'm a really bad book distributor. <laughs> Thanks. Why do you think that the idea of uh, starting narratives with images first still seems revolutionary to a lot of people. I have no idea, no idea. It's like it's baffling to me, but it's the way my brain works. So like I don't understand how other people's brain works, and I also feel like in almost every aspect of my life, whatever people tell me is the norm never seems to jive with my understanding of like the universe. So I guess it's fitting in that way. Hi, thank okay. you for presenting your work to us today. Um, right. I'd just like to know how um, surrealism, surrealist thought influences your work. Well, um, surrealism, I would say the first concrete way in which surrealism started affecting my work was when I was asked to be a part of a project that was about exquisite corpse. Um, in that particular project, it was, it was a gallery that was looking for like 90 artists or 60 artists to, who didn't know each other to work on exquisite corpse drawings to be exhibited as part of the, the gallery's anniversary. Um, and if you don't know, exquisite corpse is a, is a game. It can be done with words or it can be done with pictures. Um, you're folding a piece of paper so that you're writing or drawing on one piece of it and you're folding it over so the next person can't see what you've drawn except for a tiny little bit and then the next person continues those lines and folds it over so the next person can't see what's been drawn. Um, so it becomes a collaborative drawing where no one knows what the end result is going to be until it's all over. I started, the first time I ever did that was as a teenager in a writing, you know, writing with my friends because we were dorks and that's what we did. Um, but I, I hadn't ever really done it as a drawing practice until I was asked to do it for the show. Um, and it just sort of clicked that a lot of the processes that I employ seem to fit within um, surrealist ideas, which are about um, trusting your intuitions and, and that the, the things that your subconscious creates or the connections that your subconscious makes are generally going to be more authentic and more interesting than what your awareness, what your consciousness is going to, to put together. Um, hi, so do you have a favorite piece in your work and why? Um, I, no, I don't. And generally, when I sort of, I, I tend to think of things in terms of sets of work and not an individual piece. If I had to give one sample of my work, I would like not know where to start because it's just very confusing. Um, to, to pick one out. Um, so, I mean, I have, I have a series of pieces I did years ago that I only did four of. And when I only have four, like it doesn't really turn into anything, but I still love those pieces. Um, they were collages 
with drawing directly on the collage and the portraits. They were portraits of ladies based on a, like a pageant photo from the 1940s. Um, but the bodies were all taken from like 1990s magazines, like Linda Evangelista and like Elle or whatever. Um, so those are, that's maybe like the, the work that I have that I haven't really done any with, that done anything with that was sort of my favorite. It's waiting to find a place. Does that sound like we're done? You good? Thank you, Lauren. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Yeah.